Good morning. Good morning. Please greet your neighbor this morning. Check on how they are doing. Do you have a neighbor, my brother? Find a neighbor. <laughs> the first instruction is find a neighbor. Um, it is good to see you this morning and to know that the Lord has kept you through the week. We prayed that God will take us through the ruling and indeed the Lord has been faithful. And we want to thank him. We want to continue our conversation this morning. But allow me to help those of us who are not here. We are talking about rest. And my goal by the end of our conversation is we will have spelled out action plan for each of the things that we are supposed to do. Physical rest, psychological rest, social rest, and also uh, spiritual rest. So for the R, for rest, we said we need to learn to relax. We need to learn to relax. And we got our text from Genesis 2, chapter, one, uh, chapter 2, verse 1 to 3. We talked about outward rest from working. Outward rest. Rest that helps us to stop working, stop, and be able to move. Now, we understand and we know, and it is normal, that some of the seasons of our lives and our work are busier than others. So we are not talking about those moments and those, you know, hiccups of situations, as our brother would say. But we are talking about a lifestyle, a, a, you know, a rhythm, creating a rhythm, creating a pattern of your life. For example, when you wake up, you know what you do. You have created a pattern of your life every single day. You know what you do on Monday. So can you factor in rest in every single thing that you are doing in each and every uh, day that you, you are alive. And we said God, for God rest is so important that he instituted it himself. He illustrated, he didn't need to, but he illustrated it himself, but also he made it a command and provided times and seasons that the Israelites actually needed to rest. But in the dispensation of grace, it is you, the responsibility is on the believer to create that. Know that it is a command, but create it in the, in the age of grace. We say that rest has healthy benefits, and we also know that lack of rest has serious consequences. And today I'm going to talk about two medical doctors who found themselves burnt out, totally burnt out. And how their lives began to go downhill. One of them had a terrible accident that actually made her not to be able to be the obstetrician gynecologist that she wanted to be. She could no longer receive the babies because she got into a bad accident from a restless day at work. And that totally changed her life and found herself doing something different. And we talked about the guilt and fear of not resting. We, you know, uh, experience some guilt when we start to rest. And we said we need to overcome that. We need to overcome that. And I looked at my friends and I said, if you have ever been burnt out, you will make rest a priority. If you have ever been put on medication or put out of work, uh, like some of us, including your pastor, then you will know the importance of rest. But we don't need to get there. We don't need to actually get there because coming back <laughs> takes time and takes more discipline. So we need to deal with the hindrances and to know that lack of rest is also a sign of faithlessness. We have no faith. We are assuming that we own it, that we are the ones who create uh, the world. And therefore, we must fight to relax. It's not natural. The body doesn't know how to stay still. Some of us remember the instructions our parents kept giving us and the things they used to say, you are asleep at seven, whose house, you know? <laughs> you know, and the threats were, you know, made over what will be done if you're still found asleep at that, you know, point in time. So from our upbringing, we have memories and maybe traumatic ones about, you know, what rest looks like. It looks bad. It doesn't look right. But today we are saying from God's word, we can actually look back. And we gave three practical steps of what to do. Uh, one is do start small. Take 10 to 15 minutes a day. Imagine when you get home, 10, 15 minutes to just be with yourself and be still. Take breaks at your place of work. Sit down and reflect on how your day was. That starts small and be grateful, you know, gratitude. And then we said plan to relax. Make it a plan. Decide this one hour today, I'm going to rest. It just may be your lunch hour. 
or in your 15 minutes that you are taking a break at the end of the day, make it an hour, you know, and take a break. And one day, you know, uh, 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 a month, just have nothing else. Plan nothing, you know, and as you do that, you can actually create a moment where a whole month a year you can do that. Number three, we, we say take practical ways of resting. We say be still. Be somewhere and do nothing. And that's why we are saying we need to fight guilt. Uh, at your feeling you're doing nothing. Be silent. Go to a solitary place and learn to say no. Learn to say no. Now, one of the amazing things that human beings uh, need to discover is that these human beings create gadgets. They create phones. They create computers. They create cars. And they ensure that these machines are made in a way that they need to rest. They need to be off. Some of the modern cars that we are having, when they are off, they begin to recalibrate themselves. To reorganize themselves. To reset themselves. To cool down and to calm down. Some of you IT people, I have a few IT friends who ask us, your computer never goes off? I'm like, no, I don't see. Say, your computer needs a moment when it is off. And we know that when gadgets keep running, they actually begin to get hot. They begin to be at risk of destruction and damage. It is the same way with the human body. That the human body needs to switch off, not only physically, but also psychologically. We need time to slow down. Physically, from outward working, and psychologically, as we said last week, from inward worrying. Physically, from outward working, and psychologically, which is from inward worrying. What is psychological rest? Psychological rest, when we talk about psychology, we say it's a study of human be uh, uh, behavior uh, that is broken down into feelings, into thinking, and to, into behavior. Okay? So we learn and study about how people think, how people feel, and how people behave. That's the total aspect of, of, of what psychology is. It's about human feelings, human thinking, and human behavior. When we are talking about psychological rest, then we are referring to two things. We are referring to mental rest and emotional rest. Taking breaks from mental and emotional fatigue is something we need to do as frequent as daily. Why? Because the environment we are in, the relationships we are in, give us mental and emotional fatigue as we relate with each other. We get tired mentally because of our work. But we also get tired emotionally because of our work, but also because of the relationships, because of your co-workers, because of your spouse, because of your children, because of your customers. They tire us. We may not tell them that because if we do, they won't come back. But they do tire us. And some of us, we are not aware that we are expressing our fatigue to our customers when we are speaking to them in sense of rudeness and irritability. We don't know. We don't know we are psychologically tired. Until we start making mistakes in our workplaces. Until we start driving and then we wonder where were we going. I remember a friend of ours was sharing, um, uh, 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 oh, I forgot to introduce Janet. Oh, my goodness. Uh, Janet, please stand and uh, greet the people in Lovington. <laughs> Janet is one of our ministers. We serve with her at Trinity Chapel Ruiro, and uh, she's one of our core leaders at uh, the women's ministry. And uh, on Friday, we were with her. We do our prayer uh, overnight, Kesha, for the lady leaders. Uh, lady uh, of, of our Waridi, we call it, our women ministry. And we were talking about rest, you know. Um, and, and one of them was saying, when we lost our dad, she was so busy that we can distress at the same time and working, that when she left our home, you know our home, she drove, she had moved to Roiro at Kwakairo. 
So when she left KU campus, instead of her going, you know, and joining Thika Road, uh, or even going back to, to, no, joining Thika Road, and going, you know, and turning at the bypass, she joined Thika Road and went towards Thika. And she drove, it was about uh, 11 p.m. And she started driving. She saw a police somewhere in Kenyatta Road, but nothing hit her until she was at the Juja Bridge. Is when she asked herself, where am I going? And the first thing is that she put the car aside and broke down. Because she asked herself, what is going on? And that was a bell for her that has made her change her life totally today. She's a totally different person. That friend of ours was such a bad friend on a Sunday afternoon. Because she was thinking, tomorrow is Monday. I have not slept enough. I don't want to see people around me. So you would be with her in a meeting, and she's just, just irritated. Why? Because of her restless life. I don't want to say where she used to work, where she quit. But it is one of those places that just keeps you going and going and going and going. A researcher by the name Angela Celebrano says these things. She says that 40 things, I want to refer first of all, I want to address worry first. Because we are saying, if we want to be psychologically at peace and at rest, we need to deal with the inward worry. Worry wears down the mind. Because we are anxious, we are afraid, we have regrets about things we can change. But emotionally, worry also wears us down. It wears us down to wonder whether we'll be accepted or rejected. Whether we are loved or appreciated. <laughs> we worry about so many things. And this is what she says. She says, 40 things of what we worry about never happen. 30% of what we worry about are past experiences that we can do nothing about. 12% of what we worry about is about other people's business. 10% of our worry is that we will be sick. <laughs> is of a real or imagined sickness. And only 8% of what we worry about actually happen. A whole 92% of what I worry about, I actually don't need to worry about it. I just need to discover the 8% that I need to work on and be able to be free. According to the American Medical Association, 75% of all physiological symptoms treated by many doctors can be traced back to psychological fatigue that is associated with chronic stress. So what we know is physical and psychological rest is linked with good health. Two medical doctors learned this very well after they suffered. One is, is Dr. Bal Power. She was a gynecologist. On her normal day of, of, of life, looked like she had 36 hours of a day. And one day while she was walking out of her workplace, excited to have delivered a baby, she just found herself that she couldn't tell where she was. She had lost consciousness and had rammed into a truck. And her story is interesting. This is what she says. She says, normal day-to-day -day stresses are foundational causes of chronic stress if we do not manage them. No more. No more day-to-day uh, stresses. We cannot avoid the stresses, but we can decide how to unwind each and every day so that we don't keep carrying yesterday's stress in today and today's stress into tomorrow. She says issues such as loneliness, fear of failure, a toxic work, uh, work environment, a long to-do list can be persistent 
in our lives and become chronic stress. That arouses what we call the automatic nervous system. The automatic nervous system is your body system that receives information to tell your body that you are in danger. And this is what you do. When your body is stimulated even by stress, it brings out hormones, you know, and chemicals that make you to flight or to fight. It shuts everything else, including the reasoning system. Because we don't need it. We need to run for our lives. We fight or we flight. Chronic stress leads to burnout, muscle pain, digestive problems, headache, hypertension, sleep problems, low sex drive, and the list goes on and on and on. And when Power became sick, she of course went through all manner of treatments, and she was not getting well. And she says, you know the reason why I was not getting well? It's because I was psychologically distressed that I am sick. She was tired and worried over whether she'll go back to the busy life that we love, isn't it? You know, the high energy, you know, kind of life. She was more worried. And the more she worried, the more her physical body was not getting well. And then she found herself being introduced to the body-mind cure. She found herself in a training that helped her to connect her physical healing with psychological healing and discovered that until her psychological rest is appropriated in her life, her physical healing was not going to happen. And she picked the combination of physical rest where she put, you know, you intentionally put down your muscles and rest, you know, put yourself down physically and rest, and mentally, you know, decided to calm herself down and rest. And this is what she says the body-mind cure is. A lot of it has been talked about in, uh, in, 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 in new medicine today. Talks about physical rest where we talk about breathing. Every time we breathe in, you know, and relax the diaphragm, we provide an opportunity of the, the breath. You know, we say if you're anxious, you can do the breathing exercises. Very, very important that when we breathe in and breathe out, when we relax our diaphragm, when we relax the center of our organs and of our lives, it provides the rest of the body an opportunity to rest. And when we do that, we need to do that also with our mind. And how do we do that with our mind? We make our mind to focus on the breath and not on the environment. You focus on the breath. As you breathe in, you can feel the air get in cool and warming through into your system, into your body, into your lungs. And then you can get it out and you can feel it and you can, you know, follow it. That is allowing the mind to feel, allowing the mind to see and to stay still. But also we do that, in addition to that, the body-mind cure involves also use of words. What are you telling yourself? when you're doing that exercise? Are you telling yourself you're well? So she talks about a repetition of a word. And I love this because it doesn't give us the word, you know, that you want to repeat. When we talk about transcendental meditation, some of it is directed to what it is that you must say. But here, you know, and even some of the exercises give us some of these perspectives to be able to rest. Another doctor, Sandra Delton Smith, was a general doctor. She's written a book I encourage each one of you to look for. It's called Sacred Rest. Sacred Rest. She talks about physical health problems of, for most of her patients were and are associated with chronic rest deficiency. Chronic rest deficiency. She said most of the complaints that she's heard from her patients were like this. They were associated to chronic fatigue, chronic hopelessness, chronic lack of joy, <laughs> chronic restlessness, 
chronic hopelessness and chronic lack of joy. She recommends the body, mind, and spirit kind of treatment which should come in form of rest. And allow me to just quickly uh, def uh, you know, t show you how rest now works. We've said when you are chronically stressed, your automatic nervous system is aroused to fight or flight, and some of us freeze. What needs to happen? What happens when you rest? Another system, which we call the parasympathetic nervous system, is aroused or is, op or is switched on. When we rest, it is switched on. When we relax, the parasympathetic nervous system is switched on. This is a system that is in charge of your nerves relaxing after you have had a high level, high <laughs> rate of stressful situations. You know, think of the day that you almost, you know, had an accident, right? Or maybe you actually did. <laughs> yeah? As you were trying to control the vehicle, there was such a heat in your body. You know, you were just thinking about safety. Do I land here or land there? And after you were done, you were feeling still aroused. There was a lot of energy in your system that the automatic nervous system had already aroused. Now, when you are living with chronic stress, you're living in that state. You're living in that state. You're living in the state of arousal. Your body is always aroused. does not allow you a moment to deal with. It doesn't give you give room for your body to get to the frontal lobe for it to be able to think and process information. That is shut down. And the amygdala takes control. The rest of your body is shut down. But when you relax, the parasympathetic nervous system is aroused. It's turned on. It act activates what we call the vagus nerve. And the vagus nerve is the one that helps now to bring down your body and to allow the normal functioning of your body, beginning with the digestive system. The food can be able to be tested and digested and you know, processed well. And it helps you to be able to sleep. But there are other things that it helps your body to do. When the parasympathetic nervous system is aroused and is turned on, some of these things happen that bring about your physical healing. It produces the endorphins, which are the natural painkillers. That your body does not need to stay on painkillers for slight headaches. It also produces melatonin, which is a sleeping pill, naturally. When you go to bed, you don't wonder what you're doing. You can actually sleep. It also stimulates the serotonin, which is the natural antidepressant. Just because you switched off the automatic nervous system by resting to turn on. Now, let me tell you, these two do not operate at the same time. When you're under chronic stress and the automatic nervous system is on, the parasympathetic cannot be on. Number two is that they are voluntary. You don't tell them, now I'm switching you off. <laughs> they are involuntary. They happen on their own. They know when they have rested. They know when they have been switched on and when they have been switched off. So then how do we rest mentally? Mental rest is that time when we are able to file, you know, think about your desk, where you work. Some of us have many, many papers everywhere. And sometimes when you're looking for one thing, you don't know where it is because it's somewhere. And you know, as the professors, we are known to know that. Please don't touch my things, I know where they are. I went away and when I came back, my husband had arranged some of my things and I was like, now nah, I'm lost. I knew where my things were, now I don't, uh, you know. So mental rest is where you allow your mind to file some files, sort others out, 
and arrange them in your head. It allows you to delete files that are necessary and to move important files into long-term memory. <laughs> Emotional rest is when we are able to be authentic about our feelings. We are able to be present with what we are feeling. Not to act in performance. I don't like you, but I will perform like I do. To pretend. And to try and meet other people's external expectations while suffering on the inside. Authentic rest, emotional rest, helps us to be authentic. That if I'm not okay, I will not pretend I am not okay. What is in my heart will be shown on my face and will be spoken with my mouth. Now, one of the things that psychologists are accused for is for reading people's minds. We don't read people's minds. It is your emotions that tell us what is going on inside. And emotions don't lie. Nonverbal communication does not lie. And that's what emotional rest provides. It provides an authentic nonverbal communication. That if I'm happy with you, I'm happy with you. If I'm not, I'm not. So how do you know you have mental fatigue? Checklist, again. Can you keep your to-do list? Assessment. Are you irritable and frustrated about the day? Maybe the weather. You're like, ah, now I dressed warmly and the sun is out. Do we avoid activities for fear of making mistakes? Are we feeling drowsy and mentally fatigued and clogged during the day? Do we snap at co-workers or at family members for insignificant things? Do we spend time on tasks that we find overwhelming? Then we are mentally fatigued. What are some of the signs that you are emotionally fatigued? One big one is self-doubt and insecurity. You have been working at a place for so long. You have been doing something for so long. But you begin to doubt yourself. You begin to be insecure. Constantly overcompensating and apologizing and clarifying. You know, you know the reason I wore this today? You know why I'm here today? We are, we are always making excuses and apologizing. Beating ourselves up, melancholies, for the slightest mistake you, make, you made. We can't even listen to ourselves in a recorded thing because you're like, now why did I say that? What was I doing? So we are always you know, beating ourselves up for the slightest mistakes that we make. We are feeling depressed or angry at life. You know, life just, why is life like this? I don't like this life, you know. And, and we are just angry at life. We forget the saying that says, please carry your own weather. If you don't like the weather you see here, just carry yours with you within your heart. We exhibit a lot of worry and anxiety about situations we can't change. Then we are emotionally fatigued. What makes us psychologically less restless, whether emotion mentally or psychologically? It, one of the big ones is a restless culture. We have a culture that says workaholics are the greatest people we celebrate. Worry makes us not to do that. But also what we call mental noise. A lot of us have mental noise in our heads. This mental noise is in form of self-criticism. Constant escapism. We are escaping into something else. Mental absentism. When we talk about being present, we say there are many things we can do to be present, including eating while you're present, including showering. How many of us shower and you don't even know what you're doing? It's just automatic. But in you being able to clear your mind, you can actually have a mentally present shower that you're able to tell the warm water is hitting my skin and flowing down to the toe. Only a rested mind 
and a present person emotionally is able to appreciate that and enjoy that shower. You can enter a bathtub and not enjoy a bathtub. Why? Because you are not present. And when we do things automatically, some of us are eating while writing, and that is noisy in the mind. They tell us that if you keep eating, doing something, you'll always overeat. Because your body has not registered that the food has gotten into the stomach. <laughs> See, people who eat on the go, they actually add a lot of weight. Because your mind is not present. Fears of losing jobs, being poor, you know, lacking our needs. Regrets. We go into things that we can't change and we regret. And that causes us not to rest. We are thinking and rethinking, replaying and replaying. Some of us are replaying and replaying what the elections should have been. You know, you have another result in your head rather than the one. And you replay it and replay it and replay it in your head. And sadness fills your heart. And this leads us, you know, to places where, because we are desperate for rest, we get into addictions. We get into substance use to calm our minds and to make our minds to stop speaking to us, things we don't want to listen to. And it works. But then you wake up with a hangover and pick from where you left. Because things don't sort themselves. We now become sick. We entertain depression, anxiety, and bipolar. The passage of scripture that we read last week from Hebrews chapter 4 continues to be our backing text. And I want to look at some of the lessons we can learn from scripture about psychological rest. Therefore, while the promise of entering his rest still stands, let us be careful that none of you be deemed, be deemed to have fallen short of it. For we also have received the good news just as they did. But the message they had was of no value to them since they did not share the faith of those who uh, comprehended it. Now we who have believed enter that rest. As for the others, it is just as God has said. So I swore by an oath in my anger, they shall never enter my rest. And yet his works have been finished since the foundations of the earth. For whoever, for somewhere, he has spoken about the seventh day in this moment. And on the seventh day, God rested from all his works. And again, he says in the passage above, since those who formerly heard the good news did not enter because of their disobedience, God again designated a certain day as today, when a long time later he spoke through David, as was just stated today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your heart. For if Joshua had given them rest, God would not have spoken later about another day. There remains then a Sabbath rest for the people of God. For whoever enters God's rest also enters rest from his own work just as God did from his. Let us therefore make every effort to enter that rest so that no one will fall by, the following, by following the same pattern of disobedience. Last week we talked about the creational rest, which is the physical rest. Today we talk about the canon rest, which is also the psychological rest, which is also emptying, which is our E for rest. We need to empty. We talked about relax. Now we need to empty. The canon rest was the rest God was giving his people that was mentally and psychologically. These were slaves. They had grown up as slaves in Egypt. Not known freedom. 
And God was telling them, I am going to give you homes and lands you had never planted and homes you had never built. You are going to eat produce you never planted. You are going to live in good homes you have never built. And God took them through a journey through the wilderness where he became their provision of food. All that he had told them is borrow jewelry and nice clothes from your neighbors and then let's go. 40 years. As they grew, their clothes grew on them and their shoes grew on them. God had told them to take care of that part. But for the food and for where they were going and how they would possess the land, because there were people there, God was to, asking them, trust me. Trust me. When I tell you fight, fight. When I tell you go around Jericho, please go around. Because it's not about what you do. It's about who I am. It's not about what you do. It's about who God is and what he does with our obedience. And we can allow ourselves not to worry about what we will wear and what we will drink. Because he will take care of us. So what does the Bible tell us to do psychologically to rest? Number one is Romans chapter 12, verse 1 and 2. It talks to us to change our patterns of thinking. Because the first place where psychological rest becomes hard is the mind. You can go to a beautiful beach and lie down there physically and mentally you will not rest. Psychologically you will not rest because you are so angry at the people that you left at work and at home that you have carried that anger where you have gone to physically rest. And therefore, it is by the renewal of our minds. Scripture tells us, do not be conformed any longer to the patterns of this world. What patterns? Patterns that think that I need to do something so that I can be able to survive. I can't rest a day. I can't rest an hour because that is when the customers are looking for me. I need to change my thinking and know that in rest, in obeying God, in taking the Sabbath rest, in deciding to put my mind at the stop, switch off my gadget. We'll talk about social rest next week, which involves a bit of these gadget things. It is an opportunity for us to be able to change our thinking. Proverbs 23 Verse 7 tells us, as a man thinks, so is he. And the question that I want to ask you today is, what dialogue are you having with your mind about rest? That we are continuing with a series here that you're thinking, why are we even doing this, guys? Because your mind has shut and it's stuck to that I must do this, I must do this, I must do this, I must do this. And the more we keep doing and being fatigued, the less productive and effective we are. God calls us to renew our thinking, to change the way we think. God calls us to speak differently to ourselves, that in calmness and rest, we will find the Lord working for us. Number two, Scripture calls us not to worry. Matthew 6, 25 to 31. Clear instruction. Do not worry. And these are words of Jesus. Therefore, I tell you, do not worry. By the way, worry is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 on that passage of Scripture. Again, as we said, repetition tells you what the focus and call for us is on that passage of Scripture. Do not worry about your life, what you will eat, what you will drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more than food? You know what Jesus was asking was such a making us look foolish, in my opinion. It's like, you guys are worried about what you will put on the body I have given you and the life I have given you. I am the one in charge of life. So if I took that life away, would you even need to look for food? Who do you even need to look for what you will wear? So me who sustains your life, you can't trust me to give you food.
You see how foolish she makes us look. Yeah, I, I have given you life. That you can, you can do nothing about your life. But you're trying to struggle to eat and to dress and to live somewhere and to drive something and to own something that, by the way, you will go without when you leave this world. Ask Job. You know, the queen has died, eh? And I remember in 1997 when Princess Diana died, a lot was written about her wardrobe. <laughs> and the sale of it, I was alive and young and aware of fashion. So I was like, wow, she used to wear this. She had this kind of shoes. She carried none of them. None of them. But that's we, what we worry about. Is not life more than food? And the body more than clothes? Look at the body. You know, imagine, if you want an illustration, let me give you an illustration. Jesus says, look outside and look at the birds of the field. They do not sow, neither do they reap. But they find you have planted your maize and very nice millet. And that's what they feed on that day. <laughs> or you sent your son to buy unga and they poured it on the road. God has clearly provided. <laughs> you know, during COVID, we were living in an environment that was, you know, a, 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 a farm. And we had avocados where we used to live before. And sometimes those avocados had no one to eat. So they would fall down. And sometimes they would fall down, those, those that are nice and are ready to be eaten. And then in the morning you go and you're like, wow, I have an avocado. Only for you to turn and realize the bird feasted on it. And I used to look and say, wow, God is in serious business of feeding his creatures. And we are his beloved friends. Why won't he feed us? Why won't he take care of us? They don't reap, they don't have a storehouse. Yet the heavenly father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Can any one of you by worrying add a single hour to your life? And why do you worry about clothes? See the flowers of the field. They do not labor or spin. Yet, I tell you, even Solomon in all his splendor and all his fashion workers would not dress like that. These beautiful flowers are here today and tomorrow they are gone. Thrown into the fire. Will he not much more clothe you? O ye of little faith, do not worry. Saying, what shall I eat? What shall I drink? What shall I wear? For pagans run after these things. But as for you, you need to have faith in God and not to worry. The other thing scripture tells us in Psalm 55, 22, is to trade our emotions, our painful emotions to Jesus. Cast your cares on the Lord and he will sustain you. We carry cares and needs and demands. And 1 Peter chapter 5 also tells us that, verse 7. Cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. Be alert and sober-minded. For your enemy, the devil, is rolling around like a lion, looking for someone to devour. Worry makes us to be less alert of our spiritual enemies. It robs us our spiritual sensitivity when we worry. We focus on things here rather than listening and seeing what God is doing. We said physical rest, we must fight for it because it's not natural. Guess what? Psychological rest is also not natural. We have to fight for it. We have to surround ourselves constantly with the awareness that we need to bring our minds back 
to not being worried. We need to bring our minds back to casting our anxieties to the Lord. We need to bring our minds back to stop thinking the way we are thinking. Of all the body parts we have talked about, we are told that the mind is the most sacrificial of them all. It sacrifices itself for other aspects of your body to be safe. <laughs> so it takes every other thing that your body has or is thinking or is worried about and takes care of that and allows your other body to function. And that is why your body can function normally. But your mind is slowly taking it in and soon and very soon you will have a problem with it. We need to learn to empty ourselves. Take whatever is bothering you to the Lord. As Philippians has told us. Philippians 4, 6 to 7. Do not be anxious about anything. But in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. Please listen. And the peace of God that transcends all understanding will guard what? Your heart and your mind. For you to find psychological rest, you need to actually empty yourself, empty your cares, empty your worries to the Lord. Allow him to give you peace in your heart and in your mind. To give you peace in your emotions. The heart is the seat of every emotion that comes out of a human being. And when God gives us rest in our hearts, he gives us emotional rest. When God gives us rest in our minds, he gives us mental rest. Secondly, is we need to take charge of our thoughts. Philippians 4 verse 8 of the same text, it tells us, Allow our thoughts to rest with whatsoever is true. We focus on reality, not imagination. What is true is that God loves me. What is true, as Matthew has told me, is that I am precious to God than the lilies in the field. That is truth. Truth is, is even if I'm fired, I will get another job. That's truth. <laughs> That's truth. Whatsoever is true, whatsoever is noble, we must take charge of our thinking. Psalms has already told us that. We must take charge of our thinking and not allow our thinking to wander around. And part of taking charge of our thinking is what we'll talk about next week, which is also aspect of switching off some social uh, networks that are too noisy. They don't help us to rest. Whatsoever is noble, whatsoever is right, whatsoever is pure, whatsoever is lovely, whatsoever is admirable. If anything is excellent and praiseworthy, think about these things. Take a conscious effort to fill your mental space with restorative thinking. Talk to God, take charge of your mind, and finally, take down mental guards. Take down mental guards. As I've said, the mind is sacrificial. It does not seek to rest because it's protecting the rest of the body. Just focus on me. Let the musicians go up. Mental rest requires the mind to let down its guards. Let down your guards. And Romans 8 and verse 6 tells us that. The mind is governed, a mind that is governed by the flesh. A mind that is governed by the stock market. A mind that is governed by how much I'm earning, not how much impact I'm making. A mind that's governed by what do people think about me rather than am I serving purpose is a mind that is going to be very tired and that will lose so much in what it is doing. 
But the mind governed by the Spirit of God is a mind that is at peace. Is a mind that is at peace. David tells us in the book of Psalms that, Lord, your word I have hidden in my heart, that I will not sin against you. This is not just a memory verse for young people. This is a memory verse, especially as we grow older, because our worldly experience begins to replace the things that we learned young in our faith or when we were younger in the faith that we can actually trust in the Lord. Make your mind a sanctuary. Make your mind a sanctuary. Tell it there are these things I'll allow in and there are these things I will not allow in my mental sanctuary. Because they will occupy space. Now, when we decide to rest, what we do now is we go back to our mental sanctuary and begin to throw off things that we have kept. Friends, some of our mental rest will be found if you forgive. People that have hurt us, we have placed them not only into our mental prison, but also the prison of our hearts. We have locked them there. And then we have thrown the keys by saying, I will never forgive them. Yeah, we just throw away the key. And that continues to be what is giving you Sickness. Physically. That today you can't trust people because you never let go of those who broke your heart. That's why you can't engage in church and serve God because the last church where you were, you were abused and you have not let go. So the Lord is not using your gifts today here at Lovington just because you shut your heart and your mind for God. And today, I want to call upon you to open it up. Release it. Those feelings of pain in relationships you have held over the years, you don't want to think about it. You don't want that issue mentioned. There are places you don't go to because... They have memories, they remind you of things that are painful to you. The only way to deal with emotional pain is to open it up, not to close it. The more you close it, it will clog your mind and it will clog your heart. It will occupy space, precious space that could be useful for greater experiences that the Lord is calling you out for. Let go. How do I provide my mind and my body rest? Create a block of time in your day. When the day starts, don't start your day in a bang. When you get to the office, start with the low activity things like sending emails for 30 minutes. Start slow and pick up. Meditate. Be reflective. Reflect on God's word. Meditate. Think about your thoughts and create a mental sanctuary. Emotionally, how do you rest? Be aware of your emotions. Deal with emotional pain that you've never dealt with. Stop comparing yourself with others. Stop Have open communication. Have self-disclosure. In my life, I have found nothing to hold back in my life. Because I think any dignity I had was taken away by Christ. That I may be his. He who was shamed on the cross. There is no, you know, you know, they always say, oh, I'm keeping my integrity. 
I, I am opening myself up for the Lord. If, if the Lord can speak and use and change someone through my weakness, then I will practice self-disclosure. I will let you know I am struggling with this. And the Lord is working on me like this. And that creates very little things to make us, to make me pretend or make me not have the freedom to do things because my heart is clogged. The same way you need to switch off your computer and allow it to recalibrate. Please do the same for your mind. Shall we pray? I want you to think of a situation in your life that has clogged your mind totally, taken away your peace. Maybe things people have said to you. Maybe it's even from our family of origin, things that were done to us growing up. It's an opportunity for you to gain rest from the Lord who says, come to me and I'll give you rest. Don't worry. Don't worry about that. Don't worry about your job, a contract that's coming to an end. You are aging. You are almost, uh, you know, getting to retirement. You have an ailing parent. You have been told your body is not okay. Do not worry. Let's take it to the Lord in prayer. And I'll call Pasi to pray for us. To pray for those of us who are experiencing physical illness, emotional illness. That as we allow the Lord to use his word today to declutter our lives, we will find healing in Jesus' name. I invite us to stand as we pray together and also as we close the service. We are going to trust God for healing as we pray. That we continue to pray that uh, you'll actually act and find time to rest and reflect. Go ahead even and budget for personal retreats. You will be amazed at how much God has been waiting to dine with you in a time of reflection and prayer. And this city is full of retreat centers that are very affordable, most of them owned by the Catholic Church. Nobody will die when you go away for one night and one day just to rest and be in the presence of the Lord. May God teach us these disciplines. Let's pray. Father, we thank you because your word has gone out. Father, you know what it means for each and every one of us, and we specifically want to pray for anyone who desires healing, who desires rest. They have, they have known it. They have prayed about it. They just didn't know that there is a part to play. And so, God, as we come before your presence, these are disciplines that sometimes we hear about, we even talk about. But Lord, help us, Lord, to unlock them through our obedience. Because today you have reminded us that you will use our obedience. Jehovah God, we have been told about the children of Israel who grew as slaves. And some of us have been enslaved by our culture, things that have been said to us, things that we are so used to that we don't even question them. And so, Father God, as we go about our lives, I pray that, Lord, you free us, Lord, from anything that has tied us, my God, from experiencing this freedom of trusting you with our lives and knowing that our hard work is important, but outside of you, everything we do may not heal us, may not bring us the solutions that we are looking for. Because your word has reminded us that worrying will, only, will not even add a single hour, and if it cannot add, then it's taking away. So God, your word says that it is for freedom that we have been saved. We desire to see, to experience, and to extend that freedom through our obedience to others. Lord, I want to pray for everybody here that is a business owner or a team leader at work that has authority to make decisions to allow others under them to experience this same liberation 
that God, we will trust you with those spaces, that God, as we make decisions that are healthy, so that we will deliver both profits and deliver healthy families, oh God, that your name will be glorified. It may not be the culture that is exalted in the marketplace, but because we are your children, we choose to do what is right by you and by your word. So Lord, Father, for anyone that is struggling and trusting you with forgiveness, Father, help us to realize that, God, we can trust you, oh God, to take care of what we couldn't between us and certain individuals. Father, may healing be our portion. May we be able to release because we know you are in charge of this life and that our forgi un unforgiveness does not deliver. We thank you because you're faithful as we continue to reflect on this topic throughout this month. We thank you because, Lord, you are willing to hold us, to hold us by our hands, dear Lord, and to journey with us. We honor you and we give you praise. And it's in the mighty name of Jesus that we pray and give thanks. And the church says, and now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us now and forevermore. Amen. We have one announcement as we head out. There is someone who is selling some tickets for a Christian concert. I think Todd Dulani, I forget the other artist. Uh, so when you see someone sharing some flyers with you, please say hi to them, listen to them, and if you can, join us for this concert. God bless you and have a lovely week.